نحمد ونحن نسأل على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما فلما سلى وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا Salatun wa salamun alayki ya Sayyidi Ya Rasulullah Sir, I can't hear uh, Can you hear me now? Yes Okay, Thank good you. Continuing with, you know, talking about Sayyidina Imam Hussain Alayhi salam Now last week we were talking, you know, that he had left Makkah On the 8th of Zilhaj With his family about 22 members of his family and 50 friends and students of his. And they headed toward Kufa. And so on the way, his brother-in-law, Abdullah ibn Jafar, radiallahu came and tried to convince him to come back to Makkah, you know, and, and asking him why he's so intent on going and he said, you know, after he insisted, you know, he finally said, look, you know, you're my brother-in-law, so I'll tell you this much, that I'm going to fulfill the promise I've made to my grandfather. And then he said, I can't tell you any further. And he also, ja Abdullah ibn Jafar, he also brought a letter from the governor of Makkah promising him security. You know, that if you come back to Makkah, then, you know, no one will mess with you, no one will do anything, no one will harm you. And he said, and he said to him, he said that, you know, when I have the security of Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then whose other security do I need? You know, I don't need anybody else's security. And they continued on the journey, and as they're continuing, there are many people that are joining him. You know, everybody sees, oh, this is the grandson of Rasulullah Wasallam, so let's join. You know, people want to be close to people that are good. Except when the test comes. And then you see everybody runs away. In the meantime, you know, along this journey, Imam Hussein al-Islam asked one of his friends in the group, whose name was Qais, and he asked him to take a letter to the people of Kufa, telling them that I'm on my way. You know, let them know. The letter basically said that I... Hussein al-Islam and I'm, I'm on my way and I will be arriving there soon you know, and I expect your full support. When Qais arrived in Kufa, you know, the whole situation had changed. As we've spoken about before, you know, he sent his cousin, Muslim bin Aqil, to go and see the situation in Kufa, and Muslim bin Aqil sent the letter to Imam Hussein al-Islam telling him, look, 18,000 people have taken allegiance, you know, on your behalf to defend you and honor you, and to fulfill whatever commands you give them. And the situation here is very safe, so come on. The day Imam Hussein al-Islam left Makkah was the day that Muslim bin Aqil was martyred in Kufa. Evil leaders always have their spies. No, no different today as it was before. And this is an ongoing issue. And there are always people that are willing to sell themselves out for a small price. Again, nothing new. And so, when Muslim bin Aqil arrived in Kufa, there were spies of Yazid in Kufa who sent word to Yazid that this is what's going on. And so this is when he sent the letter to 
Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was the governor of Basra, telling him that go and take care of the situation in Kufa. And also when he sent him, he said that do whatever it takes to stop Hussein. You know, for those who say, oh no, you know, Yazid didn't have any part of this. Yazid is the one who's telling him do whatever it takes. What does that mean? And so when Ibn Ziyad, when he receives this letter from Yazid, he sets out with some of his men headed toward Kufa. And the interesting thing that he does is that he dresses up like the people of Mecca and Medina, like the people of the Hajjaz. He dresses like them as he's entering Kufa. You know, his face is covered, so you can't see his face. So everybody thinks, oh, this is Imam Hussein. And when some people are enthused to see him, he realizes all of the news is true. He goes to the governor there, who's Noman bin Bashir, who is actually a companion of Rasulullah He was very young during the time of Rasulullah He's one of the sons of the Ansar. He is one of the handful of people, or rather the handful of companions, who sided with Mavia in the dispute between Mavia and Ali. And we've spoken about this before, but to reiterate this, all the vast majority of companions that were involved in this dispute sided with Ali. In fact, all of the companions of Badr, all of those companions who took part in Badr, who are the greatest companions of Rasulullah, all of them who took part in this battle sided with Ali. And even if you look back during the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, if there was any dispute, you know, you know, as far as like an overall or official dispute that was being dealt with, one of the criteria was what do the companions of Badr say? And if they were all unanimous on one side, then that is the decision Umar radiallahu used to take. And so when he goes to the house of Noman bin Bashir, he knocks on the door. And Noman Bashir bin Bashir, right there, he comes to the door and he says to him, he says that, he, thinking this is Imam Hussein al Islam, he says to him, he says, look, you know, it's not good that you've come because this is going to cause issues here. And this is when Ibn Ziyad takes off his mask and he says, he kicks him out of the house and he says, I'm taking over now. Because this was the promise Yazid made to him. You stop Hussein and I'll give you the gov not only the governorship of Basra, but also the governorship of Kufa. Well, because the governor is the one who handles all the taxes. You know, and if you're not decent, where are most of those taxes going to go? Other than your own pocket. So when he arrives in Kufa, one of the first things he does is he calls, you know, he, he arrests all of the great leaders of Kufa. You know, the people that were held in honor, leaders of their clans, he arrested them all. And so when Muslim bin Aqil, along with 40,000 people, comes to the governor's house, asking for them to be freed, he tells the people, he says that if you follow this man, I will kill them all. And so when Muslim bin Aqil turns around, all 40,000 of them are gone. And this is, again, this is the position of truth. If you're going to walk the path of truth, then you need to be ready to walk alone. The reality is you're not alone. Because when you have Allah and His Messenger along with you, then who else do you need? But the people of the world, initially when they see, oh, there's no issues to, you know, there's no, not going to be any difficulty, they'll side with you. As soon as the difficulties start coming, they start leaving. So eventually he has Muslim bin Aqil executed. Muslim bin Aqil also came with two of his younger sons to Kufa. They too were eventually captured and executed. 
when the messenger of Imam Hussein al-Islam arrives in Kufa, his name again was Qais, he sees the situations different, he also is arrested. Because by this time, Ibn Ziyad has spies everywhere, watching the roads, and in fact, there are people that are spies that have infiltrated along, along the camp with Imam Hussein al-Islam, sending message back to Ibn Ziyad, where are they, what are they doing? So when he arrests Qais, he tells him, he says, look, I will free you under the condition that you curse Ali and Hussein. Rasulullah said, whoever curses Ali curses me. He says, I will free you if you curse these two. So he says to him, he says, fine. He says, he says I'm going to, he says, you know, I'm going to get you on top of the roof and you will curse them from there. He says, fine, get me up there, but also call the people of Kufa. You know, if I'm going to do this, then there should be an audience. So, all the people of Kufa are called. And he's taken up to the roof of the building. And from there, he starts off with Hamd. You know, the praise of Allah, and then Salatu Salam on Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he starts saying, talking about the virtues of Imam Hussein Alayhi Salam. Now, this is the grandson of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no one better than him walking on the surface of the earth today. He is the only grandson walking on the surface of the earth of, of Rasulullah Sallam today. He is the leader of the youth of paradise according to what Rasulullah has told us. And all of these praises of Imam Hussein al-Islam. And then he starts, and also referring to the verse of Tathir, which is 33-33, where Allah subhanahu has purified him outwardly and inwardly. And then he starts singing the praises of Ali. And then he starts cursing Ibn Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Ziyad. Of course, that didn't go over very well. He was, they, he was tortured and then executed in front of everybody. But he was true to his friendship to Imam Hussein al-Islam. He did not waver from this stance. Eventually, word reach or news reaches Imam Hussein al-Islam that Muslim bin Aqil and his and his sons, as well as his messenger, Qais, have all been martyred. And when the news reaches, now discussion starts among, the, among them as to what do we do. Some of them said, let's go back. Some of them said, no, let's go continue on, find out what's happened. And if this truly has happened, then we should avenge the death of our brothers. And so, Imam Hussein al-Islam, of course, you know, makes the decision to continue forward. And as they're continuing, finally the first army comes. Ibn Ziyad sends an army. The leader of the army is Hur bin Yazid. Not that Yazid, but this is a different Yazid. Yazid at that time was a common name. So Hur bin Yazid. He is a very decent man, which, is a di which distinguishes him from other generals of the time. He comes with an army of 1,000, which in itself tells us that falsehood knows the strength of, the strength of truth. You, know, you have 72 people marching toward Kufa. Why do you need a send to send a th an army of 1,000 men? Unless you know their strength. So when Hur comes, he, meet, he greets Imam Hussein al-Islam. And he says to him, he says, I have been sent to arrest you. So he says, on what grounds? He says, for rebelling, for rebelling against the, the state. So Imam Hussein al-Islam says to him, he says that, you know, your accusation would be valid 
you know, if I had acknowledged Yazid's kingdom, if I had acknowledged him as my Amir, as my leader, and then I did something against him, then yes, I would be a rebel. But I refused to acknowledge him from the beginning. And I have been invited by the people of Kufa. You know, it's not just that I'm, I'm going there for, you know, because I just want to go there. I've been invited by the people of Kufa. And he asked the person to bring the letters. And there were hundreds of letters. It wasn't just like one or two letters. And this is hundreds of letters then. You know, it wasn't like you just write a letter and drop it in, in the mail. You know, it took, took a month on horseback from Kufa to, to Makkah. So people have sent hundreds of letters to him. So he shows them the letters. And Hur said, he says, I was not aware of this. I, have no, I had no idea this was going on. <coughs> so he says, look, you know, I can't let you go back to Makkah because if I do that, then I will be considered a rebel. And then they will come down upon me. You're headed towards Kufa, and my orders are to arrest you and take you to Kufa, so I won't arrest you, but we will just march alongside with you. The other interesting thing was that Hur did not lead Salat by himself. He never made Salat with his own men. Whenever time for Salat came, he would always make Salat behind Imam Hussein alayhi salam. However, when, you know, as I said, there were people who had started joining this caravan. So when they see this army coming, the vast majority, majority of them now disappear. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Kabut, Surah number 29, you know, the spider web. Right at the beginning, you know, it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim. That do the people think that they will simply be left to say that we believe and they won't be tested. So he mentions this in Ankabut and in Surah Baqarah he tells us what we will be tested with. And you will surely be tested with something of fear, of hunger, of your wealth, your lives, and your offspring. All of these are tests and you will be tested with them. And this, these are points we're gonna keep coming back to. These are important points to come back to. But in Surah an Kabut, after he says, that do you think you're gonna be, you know, you're simply gonna say, oh, we believe and you won't be tested. The very next verse, you know, he says, what? He says that surely those they were t those before you were tested. Why? Why were we tested? Why were those before us tested? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may distinguish those who are truthful and those who are liars. Allah already knows. I mean, there's no need, there was no need for him to even send us here. He already knows who's going to go where. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he honors his servants by showing others their status. And then he says to the angels, look, these are the ones that you objected to. So he may distinguish those who are truthful from those who are 
wires. And then the, the fourth verse, what does he say? <clears throat> he says that, that, and do the evildoers think that they can get away from us? And then the last part of that verse, and what an evil judgment or thought. Meaning, how stupid are you? That you think you can do, you can, you know, go against my servants and get away with it. Read the surah. Surah An Kabul, Surah number 29. So again, when the test comes, now we see who's truly truth, truly truthful. Because it also in Surah Muhammad, Surah number, Surah number 47, verse number 7. He starts off with the words, Ya Ya Yuhaladina Amin, O you who believe. In Tan Surullah Yan Surukum. That, O oh, you who believe, help Allah. Allah isn't in need of any help. What does it mean, help Allah? It means help those who are fighting in the way of Allah and also stand for the cause of Allah. So help Allah and Allah will help you. Which most translators translate as, and he will plant your feet firm. But wa can also be used as tafsil, it can also be used to explain. Just like it can be used for, for qasam or to take an oath, like wa duha or wa as. So if you take it as tafsil, explaining what came before it, then he will, he will aid you by planting your feet firm, making you firm in your stance, so you don't waver. You know, like Qais, the messenger that Imam Hussein al-Islam had sent to Kufa, even with all the tr threats and everything that they did to him, he did not waver. Because Allah's help was with him. Imam Hussein al-Islam in, in this whole journey will never waver. Because he is aiding, he is helping Allah's cause, so Allah helps him by making him firm. Everybody else, this way or that way. Of course, Islam is the median way. This way or that way is out of Islam. <laughs> it's interesting though when we look at this. You know, if we draw the analogies to people now and people then. And you draw the analogies to leaders now and leaders then. It's the same. The difference is you know where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ As far as the righteous, there are more in the past and fewer in the future. So of course in the past we have Imam Hussein alayhi salam and those with him, those willing to stand with him. But if you look at the evil, it's all the same. The falsehood is the same. You look at Yazid's background. Yes, he is the son of a Sahabi. So his father is Amavia, radiallahu anhu. But that's the only thing. Does he follow the path of his father? No. His mother is Christian. When he was three or four, his, his mother had a dispute with his father, so she took him back to her tribe, which was Banu Kal, which is a tribe of Christians in, 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 uh, in Sham. In, in Syria. So he's raised amongst them as one of them. And now he becomes the leader of the Muslims. But he has, in reality, has nothing to do with the religion. If you look at his background, this is a man who considered marrying marriage between a brother and a sister halal.
the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bibi Aisha Siddiqa, radiyallahu anha. You know, she passed around the year 56 Hijri. So before Yazid became king. He had the audacity, you know, when she was alive, to send her a message, a proposal to marry him. This is Yazid. This is the one that Bin Ba said, oh, he was the right, rightful leader of the Muslims. You know, because these leaders, they also have their fatwa machines. So just like today, same thing then, Yazid had, had his ulma, his scholars. Whatever he said, oh, we'll make this halal for you. We'll either outright make it halal for you, or it's just something, oh, we won't even discuss that matter. Yeah, we, you know, we'll just turn the other, you know, turn, turn our face the other way. You can do whatever you want. A drunkard, womanizer, didn't make salat, except when he wanted to show the people he was making salat. You know, these are the words of Abdullah ibn Hanzala, radiallahu anhu. When he went to meet him, and he came back, and the people of Medina said, what? this is after Karbala. He came, comes back, and the people ask him, what, what did you see? He says, I have seen a man with no religion. Now the morning passes by that he's not hung over. He keeps the company of young boys. He is a drunkard, a womanizer. Of course, if he's hung over in the morning, how is he making Fajr Salat? If you look at the leaders today, you know, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, Bahrain, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Sudan, anywhere in the Muslim world. All of them are plants. People that are placed there by foreign leaders, foreign powers. You know, all these kingdoms were placed by who? Were made up by who? By the British. And who did they make the leaders? The people that rebelled against the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ma'ada, where he says that, Ya ayu al-ladheena amanu, la tattakhidhu al-yahudu wa nasara awliya. That, oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians, of course, people say, as your friends, but it says, awliya. As your, you know, these are friends who, who, who speak on your behalf. They know your secrets. Don't put them in that position. Because they are friends to each other. And the last part of the verse, he says, and if you do this, if anyone amongst you do, does this, takes them in this position, then he is amongst them. Sharif, yeah. Sharif of Makkah, who was the governor of Makkah during the time of the Ottomans in 1916, appointed by them, he took what? Seven million pounds from the British, you know, 14 million dollars that time. If you translate it to money today as to what you could buy, you're talking billions of dollars. to revolt against the Ottomans so that they would make him the king of the Arabs. The king of Jordan today is his great-grandson. The king of Iraq before Saddam took over was his grandson. The king of Libya was his son. All of them sons of traitors, who themselves are traitors. Same British 
paid Abdul Aziz, you know, the father of all these Saudi kings, 5,000 pounds a month, then, to what? To revolt against the Muslims. They're the ones who gave him the green light in 1924 to attack Hijaz, attack Makkah and Medina. And then they're the ones who set them up as the kings and said, oh, push this ideology, you know, this Wahhabi ideology. What is the basis of the ide Wahhabi ideology? Oh, Muhammad Wasallam is a human being like us. In the subcontinent, they took it to the next level. Because if he's a human being like, uh, like me, and people like me are born every day, then there should be another prophet too. So the same people took this ideology to the next level and said, oh, Ghulam Mirza, Mirza uh, Qadiyah, and oh, he's a prophet. Yeah, he died in the bathroom, and not only in the bathroom, with his head in the toilet which is interesting because I can understand someone dying on the toilet, but how do you die with your head in the toilet? And this is a curse of Allah. So if you look at the leaders today, they are, they are reflections of Yazid then. Actually, I've gone over time. Uh, inshallah, we'll continue from here next week. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Uh, understand and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family, his companions and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go ahead and make sunnah, inshallah.